Hello. In this clip from our Justia webinar, Free Law, Resources, Technology, and Legal Issues, Tim Stanley talks about the free law movement and the organizations and institutions involved. He covers copyright and other legal issues facing the free law movement. Tim also discusses using legal and government documents as training materials for AI. Remember, if you want to see more Justia videos on law practice and legal marketing, be sure to subscribe to our channel. So I'm going to cover, you know, free law, a little bit about the free law movement uh, and some of the legal issues and maybe a little bit of some of the technical issues that we've been facing uh, in terms of getting information out for free. Uh, it's, but it'll be a slightly different uh, discussion than what you might have seen if you, if you watched the ones from uh, uh, Craig and Sarah of Legal Information Institute. Uh, this is not, I'm not trying to do hands-on stuff and really get into all the details of using free law and, you know, public citations and things like that. I'm trying to deal more of the history stuff and a little bit more in the background of what was going on for, uh, you know, people just trying, people like myself and other folks just trying to get uh, a law online for free. Um, here are two of the, the main sort of culprits in the, the free online movement, uh, really one of the core founders, uh, Thomas Bruce, and then Carl Malamud, who's, you know, more than just laws, put up lots of stuff, uh, you know, Edgar, patents, all types of things. He's, he's helped get online for free. Um, but these are the types of people that I'm going to be discussing and sort of showing pictures of uh, while, we, while we talk, and then I'll get into some legal issues as well. Um, in the discussion, first I'll give the overview, a little bit what I'm doing right now. Uh, then I'm going to dig into the legal issues a bit. Uh, a lot of it's copyright, but some privacy issues, different things like that, and sort of go through a few of the uh, more important cases that, that have occurred uh, that have led to, you know, I think decisions that have been on the overall positive for, for getting information, especially government information online for free. Um, I want to talk a little bit about free law and AI. And to a certain extent, you could think of this as government information and AI. I think, you know, for training AI models and different things like that, there's a lot of government information that can be used for that. And that could be really, really good. Uh, also, you know, there, there's still the same similar issues of copyright and privacy that, that can that can show up. And then very, very quickly, I'm going to run through some resources. Uh, which, you know, play up to just the AI, you know, public resource and, and fast case folks like that. Um, so with that said, let me sort of just start uh, the discussion. All right. Long time ago, this is back like 60s, uh, right up until Lexus really started putting some stuff on, online when they were part of me back in Ohio. You know, people use books. Even when I was in law school, you know, a little over 30 years ago, I'd go read a book and I would do shepherdization using a book. And even though I had free Westlaw access or free Lexus access, they still really pushed us to use books. I don't think a lot of people use books anymore. I'm not saying they aren't used at all, but it's it's not it, they're not used as much. And I don't think you know obviously for folks like uh, Thompson West, it's not really the business model. They still have a publishing arm, but you know their revenues really moved online as well as uh, to get into the infrastructure law firm. So it's the, everything has sort of changed. But there was a particular time where books were really the, the focus. Um. That really, the, the bigger change, you know, initially occurred with online systems like Lexus and then later with Wes, first with their key, their head notes and then uh, adding the full cases in. But most of it really occurred uh, because of the internet. The internet's really what's driven almost all of the, the ability for people to access information these days. Um, so I want to quickly just, not, not a ton of detail, but I quickly want to run through, you know, the government, law schools, and, and then a little bit about the, the nonprofits at LAI and free law folks. It's sort of, what they're doing, what they can do, it'd be pretty basic, but let me just sort of run through this part. First, I, you know, if you took a civics class, right? I mean, you got the legislative, executive, and judicial. You know, legislative, this is your laws and codes, right? Normally you get session laws and they, you know, statutes, and then they get sort of put together and they become the codes, right? But maybe by the legislature. Um, executive folks, you know, uh, president, you know, governor, you know, they run the the state, they run the, the, the federal government, you know, they're running regulations. The regulations are related to the codes. Uh, right now, the, the the agencies that run it, you know, get, should be getting deference. And you know, we'll see if the Chevron decision gets overruled or not in a few months. That might change a lot in terms of how regulations are looked at. But right now, you know, certainly you see the regulations and you might also look at the interpretations from the agencies as to what their calls on the regulations. You know, in, Ju in July, you might be looking at what the courts say or different courts say about different things. 
And of course, uh, you know, the courts, judicial opinions, you know, Supreme Court stuff, different things like that. And all the courts, you know, have opinions. All of this stuff is really, you know, from a lawyer standpoint, this is the raw stuff that you use uh, to really research and do your job, right? Um, from if when you're talking to non-lawyers and they're talking about their day-to-day -day stuff, what they're really focused on for the most part are the codes, you know, the laws of the codes and the regulations. So the case, you know, they might read the cases because it's, you know, on cable news or something and they go back and they read the decisions. But to a lot, you know, if you're doing a building contract or something, you're not necessarily following the latest decisions, but you do want to know, you know, what's the code that I need to do to actually put in the, you know, this refrigeration unit, things like that. Uh, the states and, and, the, and the government, you know, from starting at zero, you know, they've got a lot of stuff. On. So, you know, it, it's, th there's a lot there. So, you know, if I'm curious, you know, the, the U.S. code, the house, you know, I'd say the Cornell has a better, cleaner, easier to use version of it than, than the federal government does, but they have their own copies up. Uh, you know, the ecfr.gov, they keep this up to date, you know, daily. So this is very, you know, quite good. And, you know, it's gotten better and better over time. You can see different change files. I mean, you got it's really nice on that part. And of course, you got a lot of the the, the federal courts, the state courts have uh, documents up. Uh, you know, the, the, the decisions and a lot of times the briefs, the oral arguments. Uh, you can also see like Ninth Circuit will put those on YouTube, uh, for example. Uh, you know, Court of Appeals in New York puts them on YouTube as well. Um, and then you have Pacer where you see all the filings. Right, this is all the you can follow the dockets. You can uh, see all the attachments. Um, the one thing with Pacer is if you get more than just a little bit, you know, if you just get a case, you know, most individuals can probably use it for free. But if you're using it ongoing or if you're someone that sort of uh, aggregates data, it does cost money. Um, although there are some folks like, you know, Free Law, Mike Listener and uh, Brian Carver and the, and the guys who've taken over recap uh, that are using sort of group sourcing to, to free up some of these documents. But, you know, a lot of this stuff's online for free and, and it's pretty good. Um, the one thing that we don't really see a lot uh, is really good standardization of the data to actually be able to move it to different platforms. So I might see one thing in Texas. I might see a different thing in Michigan. There's not a lot of consistency. Um, and that requires some work to pull the data down. Sometimes you're just, you might be just scraping the data and have to put it in. Other times there might be some XML files. Um, on the case side of things, some states, they'll put up the final official version with their own public domain citations. Other folks, they put on slip opinions and then the, uh, and the slip opinions aren't the final official ones. The actual official ones will show up in a West book, right? The Thompson West book. Um, so there's, there's different issues like that that pop up. Uh, it's probably a little bit more on, on the decision uh, side of things. Um, regulations and things, they have states and, and folks will, might, they might not be like the CFR. They might have different publication schedules. They might publish monthly or quarterly the new regulations, even if the regulations took place earlier. So a lot of work, and I'd say, I don't like to say the governments have done a bad job. I think they've done pretty good for what the, the, they have and sort of the resources they have. Uh, but it's federal government in 50 states. So it's not really easy to sort of grab everything and sort of put it together. It's, you know, it's lots of little pieces. So if you're trying to make, like, if you're, if you're someone like VLEX, right, or Fast Case, and you're really trying to come out there and compete with Lexus or compete with um, uh, uh, Westlaw, um, you got a lot of work to do. And it's just manual work before you actually do all your really cool AI stuff with all your summary stuff. So it, it, there's a lot of stuff that goes on there and it's constant work, updates, updates, updates. I mean, a lot of people, you know, hey, I scraped the site and put it all up and now I got to do the updates. And that, that often takes a lot of time. I know, I know it does for us. We spent a lot of time on just bread and butter work. You know, so they put it. Um, the other group sort of is, the, is the law school. So the law schools also have done uh, quite a bit of stuff. You know, Chicago Kent has always been a leader in lots of uh, different uh, online stuff. You know, Harvard has this a case law project with all the, the cases that they scanned in, which by the way, will become available for everybody, uh, you know, in like six, seven weeks from now. So sometime in March, so that'll be nice. Uh, but so law schools put up a lot of stuff, but they also, you still sort of see things where they're sort of working with either private companies or in this case, law reviews where they're not making everything as open as free as they can, right? So here's, which law reviews, they own the blue book and they've you know, made different threats when people tried to put things up, although it was a copy that they had not properly renewed their copyright on that could, it was worked on, uh, on the Indigo book, which I'll bring up in a little bit. Um, but you still see certain things where they're, they're, there's where some of the law schools or sometimes student organizations are sort of pulling back uh, and not making everything open and free. Um, you see things like 
something that could be a large sort of academic type group project, uh, similar to like what the uh, uh, physics folks have done. Uh, you see, sort of taken over by private businesses. In this case, you know, SSRN, which I was one of the initial programmers for it back in the 90s. Um, but they had the Legal Scholarship Network, and uh, that was part of a bunch of different social science networks they put together. It's now part of uh, Reed Elsevier. So it's sort of with uh, Lexis in terms of things, as is BE Press, the other one that sort of competed with them. They're both part of Reed Elsevier right now. Um, but this gets a lot of the uh, uh, the working papers, right? And it's also, and with BE Press, it controls the submissions of the law reviews and different things like that. Again, take it over by private organization with the law school sort of stepping back and saying, hey, you take it over. And again, you know, law schools have lots of different issues going on in terms of, uh, you know, getting students to apply, sort of running things, uh, you know, raising money. There, there's lots of different things. It's hard to do projects, which are just to sort of be group projects and different things like that. The other thing by, by sort of making a combined one though, and, and also sort of hits the, the law schools themselves is they got ratings here at, at uh, SSRN, right? So who doesn't want to be the top rated law professor for downloads uh, and things like that. So there's these ratings also play a large part of everyone to be on SSRN and sometimes Get some professors not to want to put their own papers up on their own law, law school website because they don't want to lose their SSRN ranking, which you know some law schools have also used to decide tenure decisions and things like that. Not sure downloads should necessarily be the, the way to decide tenure, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it for there. Uh, so there's lots of things that law schools could do together, uh, which they they haven't done everything. And so it, to me, the, the law school projects, there's a little bit here, there's a little bit there, and again. Just lots of different projects going on, but there hasn't been anything that's sort of, uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of coordination. You don't have something like a Thompson, that's a coordinated effort across a bunch of different things. Same thing with Reed Elsevier, coordinated um, in terms of what they're doing in law schools. And when, once you have a bunch of law schools sort of competing with each other, doing different projects, the resources aren't optimized. There's a bunch of things that go on there. One of the folks that can help coordinate that and has been helping coordinate is Kelly, right? You know, main office of Chicago Kent. They got folks at Emory in different places as well. Uh, and so these guys, uh, you know, certainly are sort of in the middle of it. Uh, and I, you know, when I sort of think of things, I could sort of see how they could sort of coordinate stuff and put things together. So they can sort of, they work with all the different law schools and help them with, you know, with educational materials. But they've also been involved with access to justice and other things to really help uh, folks in clinics and stuff reach out to people, right? Always focus on the law schools, but also trying to help the law schools help people and, and train new lawyers in terms of how they can help people as, as attorneys you know, when it comes forward. All right. So that's a little bit of the government. Pretty good job, but not standardized. Lots of different states. And the law schools, again, not standardized. Lots of different resources being used different ways. Often, you know, one professor has an idea and, you know, goes for a while and then it doesn't go. The different things that happen with different projects. Um, so the, the there, there's issues, but a lot of it, there's just so many different groups there with different levels of funding and not a lot of standardization in terms of what's going on. Um, let me go into LII and the three law folks. So um, LII is Legal Information Institute. It's at Cornell Law School. And this is what it, it used to look like. In fact, it didn't even look like this. Back in the days uh, that it initially came out, back when I first started using it, it was a gopher site. It was just text-based, right? It was like, uh, like the old... Copy server or something before they had like a graphical interface. So it's just all text, right? Uh, and you would just type stuff in and, and the gopher stuff, you'd just go through different directories and you'd get things back. Almost like using DOS, I guess is probably the way to think of it. I don't know if people still know DOS, but it was sort of like that. Um, so it, it was gopher stuff and then they were some of the first folks on the web. I mean, all the legal sites are the first, the, the first main one. Uh, and this is Tom Bruce and Peter Martin. Yeah, they were the, the, uh, the co founders of it. Uh, uh, Tom, probably one of the most uh, famous guys out there in the uh, uh, internet world, yeah, especially in terms of law, but in just in general. And then Peter Martin was the dean at uh, Cornell uh, Law School, really helped push the stuff and really uh, himself sort of pushed things along too, right? Just sort of helped getting information out there free when different organizations would challenge them in terms of legality of putting stuff up, you know, not afraid to fight back a bit. Uh, it's probably a good way of putting it. Um, Here's a video that's up on YouTube right now, of Tom Bruce, uh, back in 1993, uh, talking about what the internet is, right? And why you should care. And, you know, Tom has credibility, not just, you know, the, the main sort of legal website uh, uh, for everybody in terms of the free law movement, but, you know, also wrote the first web browser for Windows, 
right? This a lot of different things, you know, that go on. I mean, I know that when back in my early days, so I was doing fine law. You know, I basically, you know, my, my initial thing I did is I just made links to LII, right? I used to also work on the Yahoo uh, site back when it first came on uh, campus. And I, all I did was go through different, at different practice areas and then different links into the, the Cornell. I mean, that was 90% of what you could do because they, they had all the best legal links. Um, so is the LII itself just says, you know, from a historical standpoint, the first, the first ones that really got, got it going, they, they were bringing in Supreme Court uh, decisions in, they, you know, do it, then they started adding stuff with the codes and different things like that. Uh, but really sort of the main folks and still uh, to this day, really the, the main one in terms of uh, like the, the free law folks. I mean, so all of us sort of, you know, you know, look at them as the main folks and that's, that's who we work with and different things like that. Um, LI itself in, in Cornell led to a lot of LIIs internationally. Now I'm not going to focus too much on the international standpoint, but if you look in the, the world, there's the, it, you know, Cornell's the first, the main LII it became Australia. And those two guys have been sort of the ones that have helped others do it. Um, and just a lot of them. Um, there's the Australian one. And there we go. Bam, bam, bam. Just a ton of these. Yep. Just a lot of LIIs. Not. And no, well, not yet. Okay, and then the world LAI stuff, which lists out all the LAIs. I just chose the ones that were named LAI, right? There's a lot more that you know, some of these guys, you know, not with the plan, they, they changed their names. I didn't say legal information to it like, like they should have uh, at the end of it. But these were all the ones that, not all of them, these were a, a selected bunch of them uh, that said LAI. There are actually more than the ones I just showed. Um, but all this was really driven, you know, by Tom and Peter sort of starting at the US and sort of pushing this stuff up, getting things up on the web earlier. And having other people sort of copy their example. And then they would also help them with code, help them with setup, lots of different discussions. And it gets, every country has different issues for getting free law online, right? It's not all the same. Um, some have different privacy issues, right? You know, like the Canadian one, they're not gonna allow Google indexing for different privacy issues. Canada's a little bit more focused on privacy. Uh, so there's all these different things that sort of go on with it. But again, the, the core folks that started was uh, the Cornell folks. So, you know, here are the folks right here today, uh, uh, Craig and Sarah. Uh, so they're running the LII. It doesn't mean, you know, Alan Peter's still around, but uh, these guys are running it day to day. And here are here are people that lots of students work at LII right now at Cornell. They have a lot of people sort of working there and helping out, just a ton. And here they are uh, having a party. So this is sort of the the, the world of LII. So you can sort of see Craig in the back there in the, in the, in the, the, the second picture too, sort of maybe giving people cake. Um, so... LII itself has continued uh, to, to be the main one. And they just, you know, a lot of uh, student participation, you know, they write uh, Supreme Court previews, they do all types of stuff, build out the whole, uh, sort of a, a, you know, we have a legal dictionary, but they got like a real one that's sort of more aimed towards attorneys. So it's really flushed out a lot. And it's really, uh, uh, really, really nice. And lots of different things that they go on, as well as their bread and butter programming stuff. They're doing AI projects, you know, they're doing stuff with the regs, all different types of things they got. And then uh, here's Tom and Peter today, or last. Well, last year so still kicking it still around and you know they're like giving the, the background advice and sort of driving driving the world um just a few other sort of law school stuff going on here i'll just give a few more you know uh harvard did the, the case dot law stuff they did this with ravel law which is now part of uh uh reed elsevier and lexus you know in there um this is you know they scanned in all the books the west books uh and they put them online. You can get them through PDFs. They also have the, the, the text underneath. Again, you'll be able to get all this if you want this stuff uh, in six weeks, something, five weeks, six weeks. It'll be out pretty soon So for everybody. Um, so it's, it, you know, very, very soon. If you want it in batch, you can, uh, I'll just sort of leave it there. Go, go check it, case that law. Uh, you know, Rutgers is still a lot of stuff with, with the, the codes, different cases and things like that. So there, there's a lot of things that goes on with Rutgers, just to give you an example. They probably, you know, have done a better job on certain things and finding uh, changes in codes and things like that. Sort of set that example for a lot of the other folks on the states. And, uh, uh, you know, again, very, very uh, uh, good site and very, uh, John Jurgensen sort of runs it and uh, very, very good, technically very good in terms of usability. 
Uh, you know, Duke has led the way uh, to a certain extent on the open journals uh, for law journals, making sure they get uh, access out there. I mean, other folks have done as well. You know, uh, you know Rick Cloud did the, the first one with the Journal of uh, Law and Technology over at Richmond uh, many, many years ago, 30 years plus ago. But a lot of folks, and, and Duke's really been focused on that and trying to get uh, open journal scenes going. And then Jurist, which is run by Bernard Hibbets out in Pittsburgh, um, really initially started as a place where law professors would write articles, uh, probably similar to Justice's verdict uh, today, um, and then has now become sort of this worldwide organization of students writing about different legal issues in their countries, and they're everywhere. They're in Afghanistan, they're in Ukraine, they're all the places to the hotspots, but also here in the U.S. Right, we got legal issues here. It's not just international. Uh, so, you know, really uh, has made this is really quite interesting. Uh, just in the last you know five, six, maybe decade, five years or so moved it and just sort of reached out to this international rule of law focus in terms of what they've, what they've done uh, on it. So really uh, quite good. And you know, we work with them on that as well. Um, other ones, this is, you know, this Northwestern Chicago can Cornell really part of the LII now uh, in terms of OIA, which has all the oral arguments of the Supreme court cases going back uh, initially put together by Jerry Goldman, who's still uh, someone involved in it and doing some additional stuff. that will be coming out soon involving uh, OIA. Uh, and uh, the Ruth Clare House at Michigan, uh, that we, we do some work on that. These are just ones that we work on. And we work on a ton of uh, academic stuff, uh, copyright uh, site for Stanford. Uh, we do a bunch of different things with them too. Um, again, there's lots of different projects. But the one thing I would say you see here is that LII is sort of this overarching thing that's sort of pushing things forward. The other folks, we have little projects here, 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 right? And that tends to be law schools in general. Just lots of little things going on. And so the ones here, you know, good examples of free law stuff. I, just, I don't want by any means to say that this is all of them. Um, but you know, how do we standardize stuff? How do we share code and things like that? And again, that always gets me back to the Kelly guys who've always been the best in terms of getting people uh, to sort of work together. Um, so with that, that's the law school part stuff on the free law. These are the main free law folks. But again, you see some of the projects, but you also see you know, the old school jurist, uh, some of those guys have been doing it forever. And then you know, case law, uh, that law with Harvard in terms of getting a big, large archive out. Uh, on the nonprofit side, so you have the Free Law Project with a uh, court listener, uh, and this is uh, Brian Carver and uh, Mike Lister have run it. Um, they, you know, started this a uh, you know a while ago, uh, and Mike's doing a lot of the, the programming stuff on it. Um, and, and Brian's working with uh, Google, uh, but this these guys have done a great job. So they've really got a lot of information, and it's not just getting the cases and different things like that. They took over the recap project, which allowed people to add a plugin. So if they get grab documents from Pacer, they could share it with everybody. So you pay for it once, it comes through, it goes to the archive, and then they share it out with, with the whole world. They also take copies of everything, goes to the internet archive. Um, we've had our stuff, you know, go over to them as well in terms of different uh, uh, raw data uh, on different items. Um, and they've also done things like, you know, things that you always see, but like the FOIA request to sort of go through and look at, uh, you know, where are the investments that uh, particular judges have, right? And then you see a Wall Street Journal article written about that. A lot of that information and some of that data comes in from on uh, So this, you know, the, the, this site has really done a lot uh, in terms of increasing just raw access to the materials, but also in pushing the discussion forward and trying to open up PACER and trying to open up uh, transparency, especially in the legal sphere. And, uh, you know, Pretty aggressive in terms of their approach towards the courts. Uh, more aggressive than I am in certain ways. Uh, but they, you know, they, hey, listen, here's the proof, man. The site's a great site, and then they use it. So really, really good. I, I use this site quite a bit, especially when I'm looking for dockets or documents for something. I, I love the, the, the free law site. Again, a court listener is the, is the one that actually tracks everything in terms of it. And if you're downloading stuff on Pacer, you should have the recap plugin. And then if you download something, it'll be shared with everybody, right? Internet Archive, you know, Brewster, always been sort of one of the backbones of things, right? With the free law guys, as well as publicresource.org. Archiving everything, right? And uh, doing some new, he's got some new stuff that he's putting together right now, uh, also in the legal area, which I'll wait for him to announce it. I'm not going to bring it up yet, but it'll be, it'll be quite awesome. Um, the uh, Really, I, I think, you know, from making information accessible, he's not just law. But just information in general, he's been sort of one of the main driving uh, forces behind it uh, everywhere, 
right, with all the libraries. So there's always been sorry, the Internet Archive, and there's been a little bit with Google and Google Books. And there's a little bit of conflict there because Google Books sometimes locks people out with not academic institutions. He's basically trying to get stuff out to everybody. Um, so it, I think he's done a, a you know a really really good job. Um, to the extent there are any limitations here, it's only limitations by uh, the being in the United States, right? The other, you know, some of the places that have all the science articles and things like that that are in Russia and things like that that don't have the copyright laws of suing being enforced on it. But those things exist. Uh, but as far as doing things and just trying to get out here in the U.S., uh, this has been uh, sort of the main the main place uh, that you know to get stuff out. Again, we sent lots and lots of stuff over to Internet Archive stuff uh, throughout the years. And then plugresource.org. We remember the the uh, the very beginning part with Tom and Carl, and this is the Carl, right? So Carl, uh, you know, the first internet radio guy doing stuff back in the nineties, Bri Edgar stuff, patents, and now law, and not just U.S. He's and not just case law, right? He's doing case law, codes, regs, international, doing stuff in India, doing stuff in Europe, lots of different things going on. It's uh, a lot more. You won't even be able to touch the. Uh, you look at the website, and you won't even be able to touch the sort of the tip of the iceberg on things. So, just lots and lots of stuff going on with Carl. All right, this is an old old picture of Fine Law. This back in the old days when we did it, we were focused on free law stuff. This is me and you know Basu and you know, this Lee Ken, Dave Paz, obviously Stacy and, and Martin were, were there. We gave walk up some of the other guys that helped us with free law stuff. Um, you know. When we started finally, we weren't taking a company. We actually tried to get this done by Stanford. We were, and back then, they didn't quite have an interest in doing free stuff at that time. Uh, but we did. Long time ago, Fine Law is very different today. This is before their marketing solutions and everything else. This is when it was free law. That was the focus. How can we make more stuff free? And, you know, again, Yahoo 1996. Uh, view. You know, two columns. Nice. Um, now, of course, we do Justy. Justy has lots of free stuff, but, you know, we got lots and lots of documents online for free. We also give data dumps of stuff, right? So you can get a lot of our data dumps on a daily basis and different things. So do a lot of sharing of, of information. And we're just like everybody else, we're doing uh, AI stuff and, you know, summarization and categorization of different things, as well as, you know, doing some marketing stuff uh, uh, for lawyers on the directory and websites. Um, Katie Sex, now they're part of Thompson now. So we'll have to see what sort of happens here. But They've got the AI stuff going for the briefs and things like that, which, you know, using GPT-4 and sort of really segmenting out the data, the different data sets that get better autocompletes on it and using some of the other prompt stuff they have. Um, but they also have a lot of case law and codes on them. So it's not just uh, the AI stuff. In terms of getting free law stuff, there's a lot of stuff here. So they, they you know, they've been rambling. I had a lot of stuff that they got when they were at Stanford uh, and it's still there right now. So we'll, Longer term, I don't know exactly what the plans are for case techs, but they've got, you know, obviously they have their own products out there uh, for law firms in terms of AI and the, uh, the co-counsel product. But uh, there's also stuff um, just on the free law side. There's just quite a bit there. Uh, fast case, um, you know, fast case is free to most people in bar associations. I mean, Ohio has a separate one with uh, uh, the one that's connected to Lexus and Reed Elsevier. But fast case, most like we have it through California. If you belong to the California Lawyers Association, it's just sort of attached to the bar. If you belong to like any section, um, but they've you know they've certainly got there's lots of stuff that they can get it, that, that they can get if you're a lawyer for free uh, through them. Um, they've also been one of the main suppliers of free law stuff to publicresource.org and then to everybody else, right? That's been like the regs right now that Cornell and us have to deal with uh, fast case, right? Cases in the past. So they've done a lot of stuff uh, on the free law side, even though they, you know, technically are working with bar associations. But even there, even beyond that, they're relatively expensive. Uh, if you did have it before, and they're part of VLEX now. And VLEX with fast case and VLEX be very, very strong in terms of what they're doing. And of course, Google Scholar always good, right? They've got lots of different stuff there, lots of different cases. Uh, so it's free, right? Which is nice. So you can go there and very good ways of looking how cases are interlinked together in terms of the text around it. So while some of the folks that use things like the parentheticals, like the big focus on case text, in terms of how cases are related, they look what's on the parenthetical of a uh, citation. Uh, Google also can, they're so good at uh, data, right? They, they also bring you all the different instances, how the case, how the text has worked around it, different things like that. So quite, quite, quite good on that part. It really been a big part of free law. And then Unicorn, uh, you know, Unicorn obviously has a lot of dockets and things online. They've done a lot of, a lot of items there, but they've also helped a lot of the public resource uh 
uh, projects. So helping get it, a lot of these codes and stuff that you see when, uh, you know, Carl's putting them up on publicresource.org and sharing them out with people. The real sort of work work to actually get this sort of into the XML has been done by the folks at Unicorn. So they've been both providing docket information and lots of other stuff like that that you can get by visiting your site. Uh, but beyond that part, they also have helped uh, on the free law movement on sort of doing the raw work. It's just, uh, you know, Upcode's also a great place to find codes, especially building codes, right? They're basically focused on building codes, uh, which tend to be the ones that you don't always see, right? Which I'll bring up in a little bit. And then once CLA has contracts, Law Insider, again, also a great place to find contracts. These are contracts uh, from SEC documents. Uh, we also have it on Justia, uh, but these are sort of the originators of, of it. Um, and all this stuff really came from the SEC, right? These come from SEC filings. And the SEC filings are online. Again, it gets back to Carl. Back in you know, this 1994, he got the, he, he was the first guy to put Edgar online. So he didn't have to go to Sunnyvale, sort of log into a building or something like that back in the old days. Uh, really quite early. Um, then, of course, he got patents, got to get patents up during the Clinton administration and is now doing cases, codes, everything else. So very, very early with Carl. And then a lot of good government sites, you know, GovInfo's, you know, quite good. Uh, you know, you got different states, like here's Florida. You know, they've got good versions of all their codes. So you get you see just a lot of different stuff. And, uh, and there's a lot of people in, in certain parts of government that have really pushed to get uh, public access uh, going for it. I think this is an area where I, I don't know if Congress today is exactly working on it, but in the past, Congress, whether it's been Republicans or Democrats, have done a really good job in terms of getting things out. So it's been uh, quite impressive what they've done as well. And then some states, you know, Sunshine State, they've got a lot of stuff. Look at all the years that they have the codes back to. Other states aren't like Florida. You know, this Florida does quite a good job on it. Now, that brings me over to California. Just to give you an idea, some things, sometimes you'll see things, and there's different ways to find stuff. But like, here's California's code. And that's okay. At least they, they save the titles and the internal pages now. But like, what you don't, what you want to see here is the building code. Well, the building code's private code. So they go through, if you want to get the building code, they go here to the, uh, the division of the state architect. You'll send you over to the Building Standards Commission. And they'll put a link off to a paid site, and you can buy it, right? They can pay monthly for twenty-five bucks or annually, three years, right? And you can buy it. And you can buy the code, um, or you can go to the upcode so you can just read it right now, right? And there's different, you know, this is one of those things where they have the, it's a private code being used for for government standards. Some of which uh, involves uh, criminal penalties if you don't follow, right? So getting access to the stuff is pretty important. I don't think that uh, California should necessarily be charging every contractor, you know, money to read the code, but, you know, up codes up there. So they actually have it up. Here's an example page of it. So quite good. All right. That's the main core stuff here. I just want to talk about one other group and a little bit about uh, the free law stuff and really sort of who they're facing on. Then we're going to dig into the legal issues and then very quickly run through some the resources we kind of covered in the next year too. So that'll be super quick. First, uh, you know, Berkeley hippie guy right here. Jake and Swift Tony. Here he is uh, more recently. Non legal book that he wrote. Um, so yeah, he basically founded NOLA, right? And so NOLA was always focused on individuals, right? Not for lawyers necessarily. Sometimes they thought maybe they were in conflict with lawyers because they were giving information that lawyers might think you should get from us and pay us. But, you know, again, different levels of, of things. If it's more complicated, obviously you would need a lawyer for different things. Uh, they were not against lawyers. They were just, also wanted to get the information out. Uh, they didn't, you know, self-service divorce was one of the first things, but, you know, patenting it, setting up corporations. A lot of the stuff you see right now done by LegalZoom or Rocket Lawyer, they actually also incorporate into their uh, software and their products. Um, this is Tom and uh, Jake, you know, from 10 plus years ago. Uh, one of the things that you see on the free law side is that most of the stuff that the free law people, whether it's us or, uh, you know, listener at uh, free.law, um, or now, most of the people that actually come and look at this stuff aren't lawyers. They, they might need legal information, but they and they really need codes and in, in regs to a large extent or need explanations of the codes and regs. So it's, you know, a lot of people go, okay, well, you're LII, you're Justy, you're really, you're going after, you know, I'm not saying we aren't, you know, going after Thompson, West, and Lexus. Yeah, of course we are. We would like to do it. We need summaries, right? We send those out daily. You should get those. They're very We're very fast and quick and it's free. Um, but the great majority of the users are not lawyers and they're people normally looking up a code section, uh, or they're looking up a regulation and 
what NOLA did is they provide easy ways to understand these things. And what sort of us, LI, some of the others did is we actually put up the raw materials and then we've started working on adding explanations, right? So you have wax on LII. Uh, other site, you know, again, there's different sites, different places. You know, the blog is here, right? It has a lot of explanations of different things. Um, but really the, the core folks have always sort of been NOLA uh, in terms of real good consumer information. So I always think of LII, NOLA, and you know, just as sort of, we, we look at both those guys. We sort of want to do sort of both. Uh, right. I mean, LIs made me a little bit more focused on academics, on professors and law students and undergrads. No, those very consumer oriented. We're trying to find our, our way in between it. But those, anyways, these are our buddies and these are like the people that we like to be like in terms of what we do and stuff. The last thing of this overview thing, the other one. These are the not fully free things, but the ones that are actually lowering the cost of research. The reason that you're not paying a lot of extra money for, well, maybe you are still a little bit, but for Thompson and Lexus, right? Who is it that came in or is coming in that's really making it, really changing the marketplace so there's the cheap, at least at a basic level? And I've already mentioned them, and that's Fastcase, right? So Fastcase is the one. They've done all these deals with bar associations. They now have case makers a part of them. Both are now part of VLAX, which is a lot of technology, very international, right, in terms of stuff. But the fast case sort of U.S. part, uh, the U.S. focus is the ones that do all these deals with bar associations. When you're not paying as much for Lexus or West, you can think fast case, right? Because they allow you to use them, at least for case pools, for different things. If you're not using the free stuff, they'll reproduce and stuff like that. That's fine. You know, they've got good stuff, right? And they keep it up to date. And now... They're adding new AI stuff. They're spending a lot of time making it better, better, better. You know, citator stuff, all the little citation services, all the different things. All right. And, you know, here's Ed and Phil, the sort of the, the fast case guys, and then Luisa Angel uh, from uh, VLEX. And there's a good podcast at Law Next if you want to listen to them talk about what the future is. But these are the guys that uh, will be driving sort of the lower cost for the attorneys in here. You know, it could have been someone like Case Tech, but Case Tech is part of Thompson now, right? And, this is thing you always see. Thompson and Lexus tend to buy different things up. Um, but these guys, are part of, and, and I'm not saying VLEX might not sell to one. It's possible at some point. Uh, but right now, they're the big they're the big dog here. And again, VLEX came in through Spain and then went through Europe. They're doing every place. They're doing Africa, they're doing South America, they're doing the whole world, right? And then Fast Case is the US brand, and they've got the relationships with all the bars. So this is, yeah, you know, these are the guys I think that are really sort of driving down the price. So I'm not saying the free folks like us don't help drive down price a bit. We do. I mean, certainly for case bulls, but so do the court sites, right? When you want to just get a court opinion, they'll both, we all sort of work together to the lower prices for lawyers. Um, but I would say, you know, probably a little bit, the codes and regs will probably a little bit more towards non lawyers in a certain way. These guys, this is aimed at attorneys and it's tied in with more associations. So you should definitely uh, check out, if you have fast case access, you should use it. At least use it for your basic uh, stuff. I mean, the, these are the guys you want to win, right? In terms of stuff. And then the other folks that are driving stuff down, then they have a this unicorn. So Unicorn's doing all the stuff with data with all the different courts. And again, like I mentioned, they were doing stuff with the free law folks. Uh, but they're also a great place just to find information if you're looking for different, uh, you know, different filings and different things like that. This is a great place to go. And they have, you know, different sort of subscription plans if you need that. If you're a larger firm or a larger uh, business. They got APIs. You can take the data and you can, and they've, you know, they've, they've normalized it all. It's fantastic. So they've got one business where they make a lot of their, their core money on, and they have other stuff where they sort of provide it out to the public. And so it, they sort of have that combination of things. Um, but they've done a lot of stuff. And I, and they also work with, you know, Docket Alarm, which is part of Fast Case and, and VLEX. They work with us on Dockets, right? We all split costs in terms of making it cheaper. Uh, again, you know, quite help drive that, that process to help make that happen. Uh, and so there's a lot of different things going on, but Unicorn has been the other one that as you see different prices changing for you in terms of different services, they're actually helping drive down the price uh, through competition and through some of the free access stuff that they get. And there's uh, uh, Judd, uh, Josh, and Prashant uh, uh, at the, uh, I think it's at Stanford Codex. It's when they were there a few years ago, pre-COVID. And then finally, the, the bigger folks that you want to see take it over is the government itself. So a lot of the stuff, you know, I know that I've been on different sort of groups with courts and things like that, working with working committees. You just want to help them do stuff. And you might give them code examples. We've done, I've done stuff with the Ninth Circuit and the uh, 
uh, Seventh Circuit out in Chicago uh, and other uh, California courts. And, you know, it's not like they don't want to get things going, but it's it's hard. They got different, you know, cost restrictions, different things like that. Um, but the idea basically is sort of follow Carl's example where he did Edgar, got in line for free, and then handed it to the government so they could run, right? He was doing the same thing with the patents, and then they went ahead and they got the patents online back, uh, you know, in the late 90s. Um, and that's what you'd like to see is government. And some states have done it, right? Illinois has all their cases on, right? Different different states, you know, a lot of them. I mean, there's a lot of states that, that have done it, Oklahoma, different places like that. Um, so I'd like to sort of get that going, but you really want to get the states work on, get the states coordinated on it and give them free tech or free coding stuff on it. And eventually then they can run their own AI. I mean, maybe they have their own AI projects and help them summarize their own stuff, which is, you know, can work out quite well too. All right. That's the overdue, all right? A lot of history stuff, different things. We really need the government to do stuff, but you, but everything's sort of, in a way, you know, all these different individual actors, not overly coordinated. Maybe Kelly can help coordinate it. LAI can help coordinate it. Um, but that's the issue. And then you got the big two coordinators. Well, big three now, right? You have Thomson Reuters, Reed Elsevier, Westlaw, Lexus, and now you have VLEX, right? And in, in Fastcase. So those are your big three in there. And, you know, VLEX Fastcase, we'll get the win and they can uh, help out on, on, on that legal research side and that'll be good. All right. Let me, I'm just going through a, a few different legal issues here. Nothing major on it, but these are the ones that have popped up that have caused some issues uh, with uh, the free law stuff. The first copyright. So back in the old days, you know, back in the 90s, uh, I think before I was thinking finalized, I was still doing the programming stuff at the SSRN. Um, I went to this conference, me and Martin went to it, and I think Stacy went to it. It was a Computers Freedom and Privacy Conference back in 95, I think. And uh, this is Jamie Love. He was doing it. And uh, he was sort of running stuff to try to get information for free. And he was debating a former Democratic uh, congressperson who was helping representing West uh, position in terms of having copyright on the page numbers and maybe some of the corrections of the cases. Um, this is before the hyperlaw case, which I'll bring up in a few seconds. That was a debate. And I remember watching that and I go, what the hell? You mean, what do you mean they're copywriting the, the final version of law? It's crazy. So when I sort of got thinking about this stuff, you know, is I talked to Jamie, so what really, what is this stuff? Because I, mean, I was a programmer, I could program and do tech stuff. And that was sort of the initial thing that led me thinking of it. And this is again, long before final law. Uh, and back when, uh, you know, back in the old, 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 old days, you know, after, after Tom Bruce, they, they released all the website stuff, but I was doing one economic site and Stacey had a cyber law site and Martin was writing his dissertation on contract objects or something like that. Um, but anyways, this was the guy that sort of drove myself into it, and but also drove a lot of people. I was running the CNI copyright list and a bunch of other things on it. And so one of the key things, you know, what does copyright protect? So, you know, original works of authorship, stuff that involves some creativity, not basic facts, you know, basic system stuff. Some of that should be on patents. Uh, so the basic things, it's looking for stuff that's creative, not mechanical, is probably the way to think of it. And then there's, uh, you know, fair use as well. So, you know, how do you use it, you know, you know, what, what's its core nature? Is it creative? Is it, you know, sort of different different ways of looking at it? how much do you use of it? What's the impact on the market in terms of what you're doing? And, you know, is it a different market or is it hitting this market? There's lots of little different things. So normally if you're a nonprofit, not making money off it, you're doing something, it, it's, you know, it's basically mostly a government, primarily funded by the government and things like that. You can tend to, to do okay. There's also some exceptions as you saw with the, the, the Georgia case, which we'll cover in a little bit, that, you know, for the government work, whether it's not necessarily have to be the federal government, some especially with most of the law, uh, is dumb, you know, funded by the legislature, paid for, you know, work for higher type things. So often that should be uh, not protected by copyright, or yeah, and, and allow other people to grab it. So, basic. I'm not going to go through all the copyright stuff, but you can sort of read through it. But that's sort of the stuff that led to it. First major case involving copyright and free law was West versus Lexus. So Lexus uh, and Westlaw. Uh, they used to compete. They were the ones that were the you know they law school. They were the, they had the terminals. Lexus was the first one to get this stuff online. They had the full cases online. They were focused on full text search. Really came by way sort of I you know the Ohio State Bar and a professor and, or, or a lawyer that was doing some stuff with the University of Pittsburgh. At the time, it's a longer story in terms of the full background of Lexus. Uh, but they had all the stuff up, and then Wes initially put up some of their summary stuff, some of the head note stuff, and then eventually they put all the cases up. Um, Wes would note the page numbers in the West books 
on and uh, you know in Lexus in the Lexus output so that you could actually see the the what the West page number was, and West sued them saying we have copyright on that, and so uh, there was a lawsuit, and you know, so it off of course a circuit, you know, judge is pretty friendly to West and uh, West got the opinions they liked and then they then they made a truce right then they worked that out so they didn't continue appealing it. Um, but basically, the decision said, yeah, there's a copyright. The uh, creativity is West's selection of the cases. So they select the cases. That's the creativity. And then the page numbers sort of fall from their creativity. So it's really the, the selection that leads to the creativity. That, that the page numbers are an artifact that they're creative uh, bringing over the cases. Yeah, that was it. And they, But, you know, could have gone further to the Supreme Court, but they, they worked it out. You know, there's West, there's Lexus. So you go, well... How much did how much to work? How much did Lexus have to pay West? Now, again, they litigated this up to these circuits. You know, they spent some money on it. A lot of people were interested in it. Um, they paid them fifty thousand dollars a year, very little amount to get the, the full licensing in. But this was a secret; nobody knew this was this much. So, other people trying to do it didn't understand it. And West didn't, you know, ask anybody for fifty thousand dollars a year to get, you know, access to their copyrighted uh, internal page numbers and things like that. Um, this is actually discovered during the Hyperlaw case. This is where this information came out uh, later on. Uh, but that was it. And then, so then you had sort of a duopoly, but you know, it's a small little payment going back and forth. Other companies started doing it. You could see, you know, the, the Clinton administration folks uh, thought that there should be a copyright in these page number stuff. But, you know, this is the Eighth Circuit stuff. You know, West would win, right? And the, then the offers were quite the, quite the same. I mean, they wouldn't quite do it. Uh, you know, in terms of, it wasn't like 50,000 bucks a year. So Wes really had this great decision. Granted, it was in Minnesota, the eighth, basically for the Eighth Circuit, but they were using that when anyone else tried to enter. And if, unless you had the internal page numbers, it was hard to compete in terms of the free law world. Then came Hyperlaw. So Hyperlaw was, uh, you know, basically making CDs at the time. And they basically won a decision against West. And you could go read the whole, and there's uh, the, the decision. It's called Matthew Bender, but they got bought by Lexus, but it's really driven by Hyper Law because once Matthew Bender got bought by Lexus, folks, they didn't really want to continue. They were forced to continue on it. Even though the name's Matthew Bender, that's really uh, Hyper Law driving it. And that's Alan Sugarman, and that's Carl Hartman, uh, the attorney on the case. Uh, Alan Sugarman was the guy who owned Hyper Law, sort of ran it. Um, and in Carl, uh, obviously, the, both of, both are attorneys. Uh, Alan's also attorney. Um, the key thing here was is they said, look, we're not trying to get the selection of the cases. We're grabbing cases, but when we get the cases, it might include all the cases of the book. It might not. We don't know. We also can have some cases maybe from outside of it. Uh, it's that we should be able to use those internal numbers. So once we get a case, at that point, the internal numbers become uh, sort of just a mechanical because we need the case. And so from the case of the top number, which, you know, it's just a, a label in a way, not really creative to give just a number to it, uh, then we need it. So it wasn't, it wasn't quite... Thing. I, I want a copy of West Books, the collection, saying, I'm getting cases. I need to get the internal numbers for these cases. And beyond that, you know, some of the other sort of corrections and stuff that was not creative enough on that part as well. So they got they got to win in the second circuit. Uh, and the, the the items I think drove this uh, were basically uh, 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 twofold. One, I think a lot of the, the courts started putting up cases that weren't necessarily in the West reports. So now people were grabbing stuff online that were outside in West. So no longer did West not just have you know, the page numbers and everything else, but they were also and, and controlling the selection of the cases. Now they were the ones that they actually put, you know, page numbers and stuff on. Sure, they were doing that, but it was mechanical in nature. But people were grabbing all the in terms of once you had the case number. But they they it wasn't like people were trying to copy uh West uh selection of cases. They were grabbing everything. It just and some were also tied in with what West had put into their selected you know, volumes, in which case you want the page numbers. That was probably the, the bigger thing. It was their stuff going online. Later on, it became also a big deal once Lexus started aggressively trying to get all the unpublished decisions and everything else, which, you know, everybody still grabs. So unpublished meaning published, but not for the use as a precedent for, for future litigation. Uh, and that, that they became really aggressive. And at this point, nobody thinks of the West volumes as like the official collection. It's just, they're there, but everybody has their own citations. Even the, un the unpublished stuff, they all have they might not have a, you know, F second or F fourth, whatever the hell the citation is, but they at least have a West citation or a Lexus citation or a docket number from the court. 
Um, so that those are the things that sort of changed the world. But the big thing here is that Alan won the case, and he had to go through all the stuff. And you can go read the history. West was very. Uh, they really tried to raise his cost to make life hard for him. And uh, you know, I, w- I worked at Thompson for a couple of years. I know other things, which I'm not allowed to say in terms of how they looked at it. But uh, it certainly was the case. I think that uh, everyone that does free law right now really owes Alan a thanks for actually taking this litigation on and fighting this part through because. Without the hyper law stuff, you know, it, we might have lost another decade. So he maybe more, right? It, it really sort of drove the whole thing. So there's the whole hyper law case. You can go read all this, the history stuff on hyperlaw.com. All right, run through a few more here. Georgia versus public resource. This is recent, right? This is public resource.org, the seal of approval, right? Uh, the great seal of approval. Uh, this is Carl again, right? We're in Edgar stuff and he tell us all the stuff. And what Carl did is that Carl got the Georgia code and the Georgia, so there are a couple of things on this. First, the Georgia code was being published out. You had to get Georgia code, you had to go through Lexus to get it. And uh, you could only buy it with the annotations. And the code itself was paid for by the legislature and they, Lexus did work on it, but it doesn't work for hire. It was all it was all, all paid for and overseen by the, uh, sort of the, the legislative body at Georgia. Um, and there was a way you could buy a code without annotations. You go like, there's only sold one official code and it was with the annotations and said, ignore these annotations and you're paralyzed. Like some of the, the wording of it. In addition, uh, like someone like uh, Fastcase that wanted to put the Georgia code up, Lexus wouldn't license it to them. So Lexus sort of had this license agreement with Georgia to put it up with the official code and even the annotations. But like Fastcase, they had to rewrite all the headings. They could put up the laws, but the headings were seen as not part of the law. So they had to put their own, write all their own headings on it. Uh, it seemed odd, right? It seems, but technically the headings are not part of the law. The, the session laws come in, they put it there. The headings are to make it easier to navigate, but it's actually not part of the law itself. Um, used to be that way in the California site too. They had no headings on stuff back in the old days. Like the old days being like 10 years ago. Um, so anyways, Carl saw this. I know you know, we talked a bit, but we really sort of drove it. He said, look, this is ridiculous. You know, they're not allowing it on. They don't even license it out. What is this? So we need to get this going. So he sat there and he wrote to them about it, you know, and we'd done something similar in Oregon where Oregon had threatened us to, to litigate. And then they, they by the way, they're, they folks at a hearing. No problem. Go ahead and use it. We, we might keep copyright kind of, but we're going to use it. We're not just don't change the words. All right. Uh, this was the main thing they put out. Uh, but the, Georgia wasn't that way. Georgia, uh, dude, uh, public resource.org. And, and Carl was just saying, look, this is the official law. There's only one copy of the official law with the annotation. I got to figure out what's what. I do know that you say I need to focus on the annotations because you say that in your precious of the, of the, of the document. So we put it up and it went through and it, it went through a court case, right? And of course, they were calling him a terrorist for putting basically the law of Georgia online, which, you know, after 9-11, a little bit strong. Um, and there was a Supreme Court decision in Georgia versus uh, public resource and public resource one. And what was interesting here is that the uh, there wasn't a split. It wasn't a split where it's like the liberals versus the conservatives. It wasn't the split on the decision. The split was the younger folks all thought it should be available for everybody. They're, you know, public resource should be able to use it. And the older folks thought, no, this should this should remain with the, the, the state should have a copyright industry and not allow it. And that really shows a bit of a difference between the way lawyers are in general, because a lot of, especially judges, a lot of the judges are very thankful for West and, and they look at West and Lexus as being very helpful to them in their publishing process and everything else. And they're very connected to them. Um, in fact, there's, I'm a little slide from uh, Star Tribune where I actually showed how West was taking people up to the Caribbean and stuff. Although I guess with just judges that might not be turned off yet today in terms of at least the justice level. I don't know on that, but there was lots of different things. They had lots of different relationships. I mean, they, West and Lexus loved by judges, right? Especially West, but Lexus too. Um, but but especially the older folks saw it that way, right? I, mean, I, I was at an offsite once at Thompson. We had uh, Steve Breyer came and talked to us, told us how great we were at, at Thompson, at Thompson West. I thought, wow, that's just it. Uh, but not, you know, they were exactly free law at Thompson. <laughs> um, but at that point in time, but, but you sort of saw that break. But the younger guys all think, yeah, this should be online for free and it doesn't make sense. So that, that was the break. It wasn't the, uh, by who appointed you or anything else like that. And it 
Well, it was good. It turned out to be a good case. Now, that doesn't mean that this has solved things because now they're obviously going to rework their contracts, trying to make it so Lexus owns it and different things like that. And Lexus is still doing things like this. So the case, you know, this case came out with, uh, what's the date of this case? 2019. You know, there's a reply back at the beginning of 2021, but from a 2020 filing. And this is Lexus trying to do the same thing with the Tennessee code, but trying to file start copyright with it with the copyright office. Uh, and they got a letter saying, no, no, you can't do it based on this decision, public, you know, on the, based on the Georgia decision, public reading, you can sort of read it there. And if you went, you know, you don't get copyright on this now. But it didn't stop them from filing with the copyright office. They just keep going, right? And if they got a copyright, then they would bring that up if you put it up. So, yeah, I do think they'll change the relationships contractually to try to make it so Lexus owns it. And think, I have no doubt about that. Uh, not make it available in electronic format, so you have to scan it and type it. But anyways, this sort of, sort of still goes on, but this is a big decision to get stuff out there for free. All right, a few other ones, just code publishers. So lots of codes. Again, publicresource.org. There are codes, you know, there are laws that get passed. Laws sort of say, hey, you're going to set up regulations. The regulations sort of take place, all right? That's fine. You got to put regulations there. And the regulations will often cite private standards. So you get a code, you get the private standards there, and it, they, it'll, you know, you, I'm not going to read all this stuff to you. But basically, it says you got to publish the regulation, but if it's a private standard, you can incorporate it by reference by mentioning it in the, in the, uh, the uh, the federal register or in the code of federal regulations for the uh, the summary you know sort of the uh, sort of the summarization of the grouping of of the 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 federal register code which is more like a session law uh, feed um, and so basically the private standards are out there but it's mentioned by reference and that means you have to go there to, to read it now some of those guys would charge money for it right some of the times it's referencing a code it's no longer even available to buy. And now, granted, if you're at if you're in Washington D.C., a Library of Congress, so there might be some other places you could go to read those codes uh, in throughout the country, but it's not available to everybody. Um, and so Carl looked at that, and he found uh, ones that involve public safety and health and criminal penalties. And in the first one we did, I think, was it even. Uh, it wasn't currently being published, being sold. It was an old version because they had updated their version. This is the old one that was actually incorporated by reference. They put that up and started up. There's been litigation going on. So, and they would say, no, no, you guys chose our standards because and this is the argument the other side would make. You know, you chose our standards because you're trying to take advantage of us. And then, of course, you go to the congressional testimony where they're saying, yeah, you should use our standards. We've already thought about this and we worked on this a lot. And there's a whole of work with you know Congress as well as some of the states saying, hey, where possible, use the standard that's out there. Because the you know, we do private, you know, public partnerships, but you still need to make the stuff available for people to read. That that seems basic. And especially when there's a criminal penalty involved and it involves the the life, health, and safety of individuals. Okay. So anyways, you know, this is a pretty big deal because a lot of times the industries want to get all the codes. They can also control what the codes say in certain ways. It can actually help industry in many ways. More, sometimes even more than safety of the workers. Uh, but but the idea, you know, and listen, the basic idea, you, you talk to different folks, they need to find, you know, what, what sort of, uh, you know, paper sort of, you know, different sort of insulation or something can I put on some building or something like that? And they have to go pay, you know, a thousand bucks a year to access the code stuff. All right, larger companies sell big deal, smaller contractors and stuff, it's a big deal. And this is not, I don't want to say it's just the federal government. This is state governments, city governments, any place that's referencing out these private codes, these private laws, these really should be available for people to read. Now, I will say this. I will I will say that when this project started a while ago, I think this is a EFF article from over 10 years ago when uh, things were beginning, uh, a lot of these guys have now put stuff online. So I, I, I'm going to say right, a lot of these regs, these these private guys have now put online and made available for free for people, which is really good. I mean, I, I want to say that that's a good thing. Uh, not, you know, it'd be nice if you could bring it in so you incorporate with the overall law and you can make it, you know, searchable thing and sort of add in all the different sort of filters and stuff to help people research and get their answer better rather than having to go from this database to this database by way of a link, but at least it's online. Over, I don't think that would have happened without this litigation. And it was the fact that some of the judges said, hey, this doesn't seem reasonable that someone could be put in jail for a number of years because they harmed someone 
because you were going to charge them a thousand dollars to read something, especially after you went to Congress and told them to use yours. Doesn't seem reasonable at all. So this is still going on. By the way, it's, there's still other litigation going on for different standards. You know, some standards don't involve health and safety. Some standards involve other stuff as well. Uh, you know, not non-health. There's a lot of standards out there from standards models. Um, and it's also international, right? This is also having different countries. Uh, there's Every country has the same issue with private standards, private laws uh, impacting people, which not always readable by everyday people. So this, again, sort of an additional part of the free law movement, but this is on the public resource side with Carl and sort of his litigation effort. All right, this is a quick little throwaway one. This is, you know, so Tara wanted to use Blue Book stuff in their... Uh, little plug-in that they have. They have a version for, for law. Um, and the Blue Book folks said, no, nah, he, he, they can't sort of do it. Um, again, talk with Carl and stuff. Carl talked to some other lawyers. They came up with the Indigo book. They found a version of it that was out of copyright, not a lot of changes. They worked it out. They not calling the Blue Book. They're calling the Indigo book. It's a color of blue. Uh, and now it's in this uh, Jurisdiction thing. So now you can use it for Blue Book citations uh, within the plug-in. Um, but again, the, the idea that this a lot of times blue book citations are required by courts in certain ways. You know, you can buy the book, you can get the online stuff, but you know, you, you should just make it available for people. I mean, that's I'm not saying you know it's not the same as having access necessarily to a regulation involving fire hazard, but you know what, what are you doing here? I mean, if you you law law reviews and stuff, I know they need to make money and things like that. Maybe have a sponsor of it or something. Get uh, you know one of the big firms to sponsor it, but they're trying to make money off every single thing. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but this is this actually exists right now, and you can and you can use it. Uh, the Indigo book uh, and Jerusalem integration, so very good. And then the last one I want to cover here is just White versus Thompson. So this is actually interesting. So this is a case where uh, 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 Ed White or two Ed Whites and, and another guy, uh, they were lawyers, basically sued. Uh, what well, you know, Thompson Reuters and Reed Elsevier and Westlaw and Lexus for having their briefs in online saying, hey, look, I wrote the briefs. I wrote the copyright, right? And now you put it on and they sued and they lost. So Wes and Lex is going to keep it, you know, sort of use it within their collections, sort of share and use type of stuff. All right. And yeah, basically is, you know, what's the argument that came back. Um, and that's interesting because that means they can basically grab all the briefs and have that uh, on their, on their systems. Now there might be different ways and depending how they use it, right? You know, maybe it's okay. They can have it as a collection. So you can sort of see what's going on in the court case. Could they take those briefs and also create AI out of it? I don't know. That might be a separate issue. Um, but one of the other things I just wanted to note, this is, they also collect all the attachments. Here's another case uh, with uh, with Warner Brothers involving the Superman comic book. And this is there's a this is a judgment order. This is an order from the judge. You know, he's starting to scroll down there. But anyway, this is an important part. Uh, a full reproduction of the original Superman comic uh, contained in Action Comics Volume 1 is attached as an addendum to this order. The guy put the whole comic book as part of the order. Now, I'm certainly the comic book, you know, has copyright. It's not yet you know, as old as Mickey Mouse, uh, is the initial Mickey Mouse stuff. Um, and here's the comic book. It's, a, it's an attachment, right? You know, each, each attachment had two pages, but I just top page each attachment. Well, there you go. I mean, interesting on that part. So I'm going to keep going. So I realize some people, the hours here, but I've got more stuff I want to cover. I'm just going to go over. So do that periodically but this is a good break if, if you, got, you got the core copyright stuff the other stuff it's sort of a little bit more secondary in terms of importance or you can watch it later on on youtube or on, on our videos platform uh, but let me just start keep going here privacy issues all right this is the second thing that comes up a lot with cases especially in the u.s so here's a list of uh different files that were downloaded these were different attachments and documents that are downloaded from pacer so there was a brief period of time where Pacer allowed you to actually download stuff for free if you went to certain places, like certain libraries and things like that. And this guy, Aaron Schwartz, who you know died, you know, actually committed suicide, did different things going on with uh, different things working on, but very pro, very big in the free law world. Um, had uh, downloaded all this uh, these documents. And take them and put them online and then share them over to publicresource.org and, and Carl and stuff like that. And so Carl got these documents. And listen, the FBI is talking to here, the FBI is talking to Carl. Um, and Carl took all these documents that they got and he went through and said, you know what? I'm not going to just put these documents online because there's a lot of stuff that, that's there. Uh, but he went through and he said, where 
can I find, you know, certain privacy issues, right? Like social security numbers or driver's license numbers and went through all the documents he has and took them by the courts and gave them grades. Like some got A's, some got, you know, F's, right? In terms of it. And then sent a report back to the uh, the, the, the different uh, chief justices of each of the district courts. And you can see here, the A's like, uh, you know, Northern California, District California got an A, Florida District got an A, uh, you know, some of these, some of them we didn't have uh, cases from. Some got F's. You know, some of the ones who read Western Pennsylvania, things like that. Um, but really, just went through. I mean, again, the, the the scores were scores. But the big thing here was there were tons and tons of social security numbers and different privacy things. And here's just a couple examples. Like there was one where, uh, you know, it, 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 it there was a a, a a filing that had the the social security numbers and medical problems of 353 patients of a doctor, right? There's another one where a guy had not been paid by a school, so he put in the the names of all the uh, kids that he, that he was treating with their home addresses and their psychological issues, right? There's another one here. Uh, you know, in Alabama, they constantly were putting in the, the social security numbers and different things, birth dates of police officers and state employees for some reason. Um, anyway, there, there's a bunch of examples. These are just some of the highlights uh, of it, where they had tons and tons in just these particular types of filings. Um but this stuff, you know, should be redacted. Now, what the courts eventually said, well, that's up. The lawyers are in charge of doing that. We're not taking responsibility for it. Although, uh, you know, Carl gave them some scripts that they can run to easily find it. It's not, you know, three digit, two digit, four digit, not, not too hard to, to run a script on it. And similar for uh, driver's licenses and other personally identifiable information. You know, that that type of stuff, that happened, it would be harder to happen than the the European Union, they're a little bit more tough on that stuff, right, than the U.S. U.S. has not done a very good job in terms of privacy of people. Really hasn't on it. So there's a lot of different things that go on. And, and again, you put these stuff online, it can really hurt people, you know, especially, you know, big companies, that's one thing, but individuals, it's the first thing that shows up, especially things like dockets where sometimes the stuff's very one-sided and not necessarily always true, but different things. Um, it's not just court documents. It's also things like, Social security numbers of military personnel getting uh, um, increases in rank. They used to publish the names of the military folks in the congressional record at certain levels, and it was captain above or major above. And they post them with their social security number. It took them a long time to remove this stuff. In fact, it didn't really get removed until this article, Stars and Stripes, showed up. Uh, even though the opportunity to remove it earlier uh, without this, uh, but it just took a while. Um, for us, you know, we have a way that you will remove it from search engines. Uh, so, we, you know, I'm not saying I can think of some particular cases where we might fully remove a document, right? If it involves a minor or something, there's a couple of things. Uh, but uh, court cases, we don't remove. And, but we will remove it from Google and uh, the other search engines. And that really tends to be the main thing is so they don't show up in search uh, on that part. And it's not just us. There's a bunch of us free law folks that work together to, to remove things. And then with Google, you can also go in and get things removed for your name. So if something shows up for your name, you can get it. I'm not saying the document will be removed out of Google, but it'll be removed out for any name searches involving you. You just have to show what the, the information is. Normally, they're looking for personal identifiable information, uh, but you can. There, Google has a removal tool, and you can certainly contact them there if you have something that you want removed or you have a client that wants something removed. With us, just ask us. We'll, we'll put a robots on it, and we'll take it out, uh, unless you're like a huge company or something like that. If you're, so some large companies were not necessarily going to do it because, you know, they, Walmart wants all their stuff removed and it might not be happening. Uh, but anyways, those uh, separate items or a Supreme Court case. We all remove the Supreme Court case. Uh, public access. Again, this is basic stuff. We sort of covered this within the mix. You know, this is Cato saying, you know, it's talking about Carl. You know, Cato is a pretty conservative, very pro free info. And this has been a lot of the right. I don't want to say this is like left stuff. A lot of the people on the right side of the aisle also want a lot of information up, maybe for different reasons, but they certainly want it up. Uh, so this is the statement. I don't know, it's something Latin, but it means ignorance of the law is no excuse. The cartoon I found online here, ignorance of the law is no excuse. I didn't know that either, right? This sort of type of thing. But if you can't read the laws, you got a problem. So the basic stuff that we see, text is available online. You can try to address that. That's a bigger thing that you can't get it. Uh, you can access to view it by the cost of money. Again, this goes back to not there at all. Next thing is... Uh, you got to pay money for it. And for those types of things, you know, we sort of brought up the code examples of there. And then sometimes the text is wrong. And this is the thing that sort of bothers me the most uh, uh, to a certain extent of the public access part. And I'll give you just an example. Here's the Mississippi code. 
uh, so specific code annotated, but the only really annotations uh, on it, the instance or where the previous history is on this. Um, but this says, you know, any mirrors, this is current code, not later. And, and I've used this in my AI talks as well in terms of how autocomplete can be wrong sometimes in terms of uh, using AI. But any mirrors between a person of the same gender is prohibited and null and void. That's, that's what it currently says. So if you're a Mississippi resident, you go and you look up the code, uh, you might not be happy because the code... Um, is basically uh, not the current state of the law because it doesn't take care into context federalism and everything else that goes with that, right? In terms of the Supreme Court opinion. But you've got to understand, codes are legislative intent documents. That's it. They're not necessarily the law. And when you put up an unannotated code, you put up an, you put up a legislative intent document and yet people think it's the law. And so individuals don't understand the, that nuance at all. So the failure to put up the annotations or just correct their code to the current state of law, which they're not going to do because it's really about the, what was passed by the legislature and the legislation, legislature in Mississippi, I don't think is going to pass same-sex marriage even if it's legalized anyways, at least right now. Um, you know, they, they, there should be something done here because a lot of people didn't take this and then they, they might be breaking law or doing something illegal or not recognizing something even though there's a Supreme Court opinion that's overriding it. And this is getting... You want the annotated stuff, you get that from Lexus. Georgia one, again, it says this is the one where you actually got the annotations up as well. So they did not distinguish between the annotations and the uh, uh, the actual code because it was written as one work for hire by the legislature. The key thing there was written by the legislature. Even though the annotations technically were law, the fact that they were clarified by the legislature actually made them a public document for, for all purposes in terms of how they interpret the law. But that was a, a key thing here in the public resource case as well. They didn't come and say, all right, you put up the you can put up the code, but you can't put up the annotations. No, no, no. Both were okay. So re relatively important. They could have they could have split it uh, that way had they had they wanted to. All right. Well, we keep going. We're gonna do free law and AI. This won't be good. So first, start to remember this guy in front of the, who used AI and then cited weird cases that were wrong. They don't need, and I, I, listen, I'll point up here because at some point someone will put a link to the other videos that I've done on uh, AI and uh, ChatGPT. But don't just use ChatGPT for this, okay? Just don't, it, or at least double, triple check your work or write prompts that force it to try to get better autocompletes. AI is not, it's not like some knowing thing. It's an autocomplete system. And I'm, yeah, I'm not going to go into details of AI and cover that in other videos, but you don't want to be this guy, all right? The so first thing is, there's a bunch of big players here. It's really, the, what's really new about AI is the amount of power it has in terms of doing these autocompletes. And there's OpenAI, there's Google, Anthropic, there's Meta, you know, Facebook, uh, getting their Llama stuff. And then a bunch of projects using some of these other models, like Stanford has a project. There's the Open Llama project that you can get on GitHub right now. Um, some of this you can run on your computer, some you need the other systems. You can get different training data. And some people, you know, technically you can use models to train models if you want to. Um, they don't want you to do it, but it is happening. Uh, lots of stuff going on. So again, very beginning stages of it. You don't really know who's going to win. My, my guess is be one of the, you know, one of the big four that we mentioned here. It'll probably be open AI with Microsoft, really Microsoft to a large extent. Uh, Google, Anthropic really tied in with uh, Amazon right now or Facebook with their llama. But, you know, I mean, and, and we're doing tech stuff with law. So this should be getting cheaper and cheaper and faster and faster, right? We're not talking yet about making movies using AI. We're just talking about trying to process text and, classify and summarize documents and find relationships and patterns. Um, so things should be getting better and better on those things. To me, AI is going to end up being just like spell check, grammar check. It'll be, you're going to use it. So I wouldn't even, again, just use it. That, that part's, I think that's just a given at this point. Everyone's saying, yeah, you can use it, but you got to check your work. All right, well, check your work, right? I mean, same same with anything. You like key cider separatization. Again, you use this all the time if you're a practicing attorney. You'll end up using AI the same way. In fact, you'll be using it anyways, even if you don't know you're using it, because uh, Thompson and Alexis are going to use it to summarize their case and find the relationships and actually hide into their search and everything else to help you find the relevant information, as is um, VLEX and, and the other folks using AI for it. I mean, classify it, stare, you know, you can find the different relationships, you can find relationships between cases, you know, there are lots of ways to do it. And it, again, it can process huge amounts of data pretty quickly. So a lot of things you can do if you have good data that you can do good things with for a while, and that will happen. Uh, the question is, is it only going to be the, the the big two, big three companies now with VLEX, uh, or will other people come together and make something really good that's useful and free? 
All right. Legal side, case text, Chris, now part of Thompson, right? Uh, there's Thompson. They were part of that. Lexus has stuff. Be Lex. Um, you know, for the law side, there's other ones. There's you know, guys doing contracts and other things. Like I don't want to say these are the only ones that are out there, but these are probably the main, uh, the main ones right now with Thompson, uh, uh, Reed Elsevier and v uh, You should try them out. You should see what, and see if it helps you. Uh, it should be helping them reduce cost. I do know that they're now using it to charge you more. I'm not saying there's not charge cost involved with it, but it's primarily, a lot of the AI is primarily to help Thompson not, not to need as many editors in India, right? To, to write their summaries. Um, and they're, they're, well, this has been happening for years. I mean, Thompson's pretty good at AI stuff. So yeah, their, their engineers are quite good. But again, you got to check your work. Don't be this guy or this guy. I mean, this is you know, no excuse here. It happened many times after. At least he caught it before it and told the other side. But you, you got to check it. You can't just use AI. You got to check the cases and things. Come on. I mean, basic. I mean, that's basic stuff on that part. All right. Data availability and accuracy. All right, here's the chat GPT stuff. They were using the common crawl. Can they, you know, Carl's on their board as well on that part. You know, Justia was one of the, the top sites on it, but really Justia's collection of government documents are one of the top sites. The number one site, by the way, was Google Patents. Um, the main thing I would uh, point out about this, though, is that there's lots and lots and lots of government documents out there, right? Court Lister has a lot of documents. Um, be law guys, right? They have tons of documents as well. There's, you know, Google has lots of government things too. I don't know, their court stuff. Um, but there's just tons of stuff. So you got the court documents. You have all the other federal government documents. You might have all the documents you have from state governments that you can use. You go to the federal government, they have a whole data set search. You can find all types of different uh, government uh, uh, data sets with Google, right? Give you a few, huge data dumps of documents. Um, I think you could do a pretty good job if using government documents to train a lot of these models. In fact, I would say that using the web in general is a little bit iffy because a lot of the stuff on the web is really, really crappy, right? You know, even stuff written by law firms sometimes isn't too good. So the government stuff tends to be better. I mean, granted, you know, don't do Trump's tweets if you don't want things in all caps and misspellings and stuff like that. But a lot of other government stuff, you know, that part of the official record is quite good. And that'll be a, a great place to train it on AI. Right, a lot of this it really, really good. I mean, regardless of how people feel about the deep state. Um, that said, not all government documents and different things are are equal. Right, you got the accuracy issues. A lot of people say, "Oh yeah, we're grabbing all the Pacer data. We're going to run auto complete all that, so we'll grab great briefs." Well, this is a brief, right, written by a pro se guy, pro se plaintiff, um, and it's told gibberish, right. I took out some of the personal information that he soon and filed with it. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot, a lot of really crappy briefs um, if you go ahead and you and you look online, right? I mean, these guys wrote some briefs too. They got their own issues, right? You got you got to look through it. Um, there are things where, again, you ought to complete stuff off and you're using government data, but the data's wrong. Going back to the Mississippi Code, right? That we're talking about. This is not true. Yet if you used AI for it, this this one said it's not legal Mississippi. I, again, I showed this in the previous AI talk, but and then this one says it did become legal because of the Supreme Court case. AI doesn't always get it. AI is just auto-completing stuff. If your data is bad, it will it'll auto-complete bad stuff. If your data is old, it's going to auto-complete off old data, right? Yeah, you, you, you our web crawls up to 2021. Well, a lot of those documents were from before, you know, 2010. You know might be different bankruptcy laws, might be different all types of stuff, right? Especially in law. You really got to be careful. So I'd much prefer if I was really doing legal stuff to use a legal data set, whether it's VLAX or Thompson or Waxus, I'd be really hesitant using ChatGPT because a lot of the data it has is going to be older data, right? It's just the way it is. And a lot of it's going to be non law, a lot of it's going to be opinion pieces or Reddit threads, right? You know, Reddit, you can end up writing all types of crazy stuff. So, Ways you can make stuff better if you are using ChatGPT, you don't have access to other ones, put in detailed prompts, asking it to explain how it does things, right? Is same-sex marriage legal Mississippi? And please explain the steps you, you took to get the answer. Anything you do to actually make it do extra work tends to take it to better sources and better autocompletes. I'm not going to go into all the details right here, but 
yeah, you know, called you know, using prompt engineering, but you know, making your prompts more detailed so it doesn't just autocomplete something really quick, right? The same thing. They ask for details, it has to try to answer what you asked in terms of what the autocomplete would do. To answer a question like that, it's just a little bit more detailed. And of course, there's you know, you get all types of stuff, right? The venting, sexual harassment, all types of stuff can happen with Chat GPT, right? Or any AI, to be that matter. Right. Copyright and authorship. All right. Well, you got the pacer documents, right? You got SEC patents and trademarks, All right? The reason I bring this up is you got two separate collections of documents, one and stuff that's actually produced by the federal government itself or different states, the laws, the regulations, congressional research service reports or whatever it is, GAO reports, right? That's produced by the federal government. The other stuff is stuff that's produced by individuals in private filings for the federal government. So that stuff, okay, well, we saw the fair use case. That no, I know where Wes and Lexus one, they could put up the briefs and things like that. But, you know, could they put up that Superman comic and resell it? Could they take the Superman comic and then use that for autocomplete? What happens if I attached all of Dave Chappelle's uh uh comic routines in some litigation I'm doing because I think uh, you know, for whatever reason I'm suing him or something. If I add every single routine he did, that gets picked up by uh by Thompson and they put it into their AI. Now they use that for making an auto joke completer. Right, just because it's filed with a government filing, does that make it? You know, what is that allowed to be used for? It's maybe be allowed to use for if I'm going to look at the case to see what was argued and what was attached to the case. That's different than saying all these documents can necessarily be used for AI. And I don't think that's been resolved at all yet. But there, there have been instances like there, there was a case where I think the entire Harry Potter book was attached. If that's attached, you could probably use uh, props in a way to actually get the the book back. Does that mean it's no longer copyright? Right. And, and, and could they just use it however they want? So the how the use cases here becomes a little bit more important on the fair use side. And I don't think right now people have thought that part through. Certainly they didn't think it through when they started using AI for all the uh open AI and everything else, which is why New York Times is suing and other people are saying, Hey, you crawled our content for your open AI stuff. And you could easily get back the full story. This isn't right, right? In terms of how you use your prompts. So there's a lot of different stuff going on here. And while there's government documents, there's also these filings attached to government documents. Again. You've got the um, just you know, just your 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 case filings. You've got contracts filed with the SEC, patents, trademarks. There's a lot of work product either from that's owned by your clients or owned by the law firm, right? Depending on how the how the ownership goes on that, uh, that can then be used by your competitors using your using AI then to write a brief against you, right? So in, in that part, even if they're just using it to research you, there's all types of different things that can go on there. So there's a lot of different stuff here that needs to be resolved. Uh, it has not been resolved, not just for open AI and Google and Anthropic and Meta, but also for the the, the, the legal folks using their backends for, but on different content sets. Again, this is the same thing. This is the, the fair use case that Thompson won in there. It's the Superman thing, which again, we brought up. But yeah, again, this could have been Dave Chappelle's jokes. It could be anything. Privacy stuff, again. Lots of private stuffs there in the, this information that's being indexed. And you can use AI to sometimes pull this information out. So unless you've added privacy filters on top of your data, some of that data can come back. Sometimes they'll just make it up, as we saw with the previous one, but also there's there's some real privacy issues here on that. Okay, that's the basic core of the talk. And then a little over. Resource stuff, I'll just really quick run through this, just take a couple of seconds. You know, court cases, we got Supreme Court Center. We got daily opinions that just, yeah, that's, that stuff's pretty good on different things. Lots of different opinions. You get daily. Um, Harvard case dot law project. Good for getting stuff again. You can actually get all this data if you want to do your own project uh, in a few weeks. Uh, case text has, you know, not, forget about just the AI stuff, but they also have good cases and codes and different things on their site. Fine law still has some cases and codes. So I'll leave it there. Uh, court listener, part of the free law stuff. It's really good stuff too. And fast case. Most of you guys are lawyers. You should have access to fast case or whatever else you can sort of do using the fast case VLEX uh, partnership. And they'll have a lot more AI tools and things like that. They're, they're really good. Docket stuff. You know, we have our docket stuff. There's court list there and the Unicourt. Uh, again, depending on what you're looking for, uh, you know, I think the, the recap stuff, court list there might have more stuff on lots of different topics. We have certain selected cases. Unicorn has like lots and lots of stuff, almost everything. I mean, that's sort of a bigger play on that part. And then for basic, you know, legal information and codes, you got LII, you got us, you got fine law, case decks again, 
fast case, you know, basic stuff like that on that part. And then just, uh, uh, you know, free law folks in, in general, these are sort of the main ones that I see. LII, the biggest one that starts everything. The free law project, sort of, you know, in the mix with LII. Public resource art with Carl, sort of also handling the litigation stuff like that. No law on the consumer side, uh, still the best. And in fast case, uh, in terms of uh, the stuff that they're doing uh, with uh, control lawyers, especially with bar associations. And of course, there's us, just yeah, or someone else who knows. We have lots and lots of stuff on that. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did enjoy it, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more videos on law practice and legal marketing. See you in our next clip. Bye.